Hey everyone, Ryan here, and welcome to this brand new series on operative dentistry. Operative dentistry is central to the everyday life of a general dentist, and it's the art and science of diagnosing defects of teeth, treatment planning these cases, and then treating them with direct restorations to restore comfort, health, function, and aesthetics for the patient. Now we're going to cover a lot of great topics in this series, and that being said, like all my videos, I'm going to focus on the highest yield things that you need to know to do well on the board exam. My hope is that this set of videos will help you prepare for the board exam and also give you a nice overview for a clinical application and general knowledge. So we're going to start by talking about what teeth are made out of and we're going to start the discussion with appetite. Now this doesn't mean you're hungry in this case, but rather it's a classification of naturally occurring phosphate minerals. They're isomorphous, which means they all have the same crystal lattice and molecular structure. If we work through the math a little bit, the calcium ion is 2 plus, the phosphate group over here is 3 minus, so we get 2 times 5 is 10 plus for all of the calciums in this molecule. 3 minus, we have 3 times, so that's 9 minus. So we need a minus 1 valence to make this entire molecular group neutral. And so we have a couple of choices. We can do a hydroxyl group, a fluoride ion, or a chloride ion for some examples. And we're going to focus on the first two and these correspond to the names of the types of appetite depending on the group you're using to substitute. Hydroxyapatite, fluorapatite for fluoride, chlorapatite for chlorine. So biological appetites refer to the particular appetite minerals that compose some of our body structures like enamel, dentin, and bone. And there's a special hydroxyapatite that we'll talk about in a little bit that composes our teeth and our bones. So let's look at hydroxyapatite a little bit closer. We substituted the hydroxyl group in order to make this molecule ne neutral, and then we just doubled everything. We went from 5 to 10, 3 to 6, and so on from the previous slide. And that's because that's how it's reported commonly in the literature. And you can appreciate its hexagonal structure here and how the atoms are arranged within the unit cell. Pure hydroxyapatite powder is this uh, white powder down here, and by itself it is biocompatible for things like bone implants, but it has a low bioresorption rate, which means it doesn't quite mimic the inorganic portion of our bones and our teeth. So then we talk about carbonate substituted hydroxyapatite which is actually the main component of enamel and dentin. And it's carbonate substituted because we have these little CO3 carbonate groups that are added into the mix. This is our naturally occurring hydroxyapatite. The tooth is about 85% hydroxyapatite by volume and 95% by weight. And that's because it's a packed crystal that weighs relatively a lot for its small size. If we're talking about enamel specifically, ameloblasts are literally stacking these unit cells on top of each other during amelogenesis to form crystallites that create these long enamel rods or enamel prisms. Enamel rods are built with this keyhole pattern. Interesting to note, each enamel rod has a head and a tail, and the tail tends to be more organic and have less mineral content, and thus more susceptible to decay, which is good to know for the board exam. So carbonate substitution increases the solubility of the hydroxyapatite. And enamel is structurally and compositionally different from site to site. For example, the enamel tends to have more carbonate substitution here near the DEJ, or the dentin enamel junction but it tends to be more fluoride substituted or fluorapatite near the outside where fluoride can bathe the tooth 
with fluoridated water, mouth rinse, and toothpaste. We'll talk more about fluoride in a little bit, but the important thing here is that the deeper a cavity penetrates into the tooth, the more soluble that enamel will be because it has more carbonate substitution. And don't worry, we're going to talk about that more in depth later in the video. All right, so now we can talk about how cavities work. And this is super interesting. I really hope you find this as fascinating as I do. So there's an equilibrium that we can see here constantly going on between hydroxyapatite in the tooth and the free calcium and phosphate ions that are floating around in the mouth and in the plaque covering the teeth. Calcium and phosphate ions are constantly being traded back and forth from the tooth to the mouth and the plaque and back to the tooth and so on. Now we've always been told that sugar is bad for your teeth and will rot your teeth out of your mouth. But I'm here to say that's not entirely true. That's actually not the full picture. So sugar by itself is actually a preservative. It soaks up the water that many bacteria thrive in and so it prevents the growth of microbes that can spoil food like jams and jellies. But our mouths are different and offer the perfect moist environment for bacteria with lots of nooks and crannies for them to grow in. Think about all the pits and fissures of your back teeth. Special bacteria that cause caries, we call those cariogenic bacteria, digest these sugars that we consume for their own energy via glycolysis, and then go one step further to produce lactic acid via fermentation. This organic acid, which is represented by this hydrogen ion here, so this is our acid, is secreted directly onto the tooth enamel and is the actual culprit. So these hydrogen ions, complex with the free phosphate in the mouth, to form phosphoric acid. And this preferential connection between the hydrogen ions and the phosphate ions drives this entire reaction to the right. So not only this part of the equilibrium, but also this part of the equilibrium gets dragged to the right as well. And that's due to Le Chatelier's principle, which states as we lose molecules on one side of the equation, the equilibrium seeks to restore that imbalance. So if hydrogen pulls this reaction to the right, it will also pull this reaction to the right. And in doing so, it pulls calcium and phosphate ions out of the tooth, weakening that tooth structure. And this is how sugar and bacteria cause tooth decay. This is the process we call demineralization, which is a super important board exam term. Now there are also other more direct sources of acid, GERD or acid reflux, or frequent vomiting from bulimia can cause gastric acids to come in contact with teeth, which if chronic can cause acid erosion. Also lots of drinks like soda have citric, carbonic, and phosphoric acids that can also increase the hydrogen ion concentration in the mouth and thus lower the pH of the mouth even more. Since soda also has sugar, you get the double whammy effect of both sugar and acid pulling this entire equilibrium to the right and literally leaching minerals out of the teeth. Next, let's talk about the Stefan curve, which almost always shows up on the board exam in some capacity. We have plotted on the y-axis the pH of the plaque, and by extension, the mouth and the oral cavity. The lower that this pH is, the more acidic the oral environment. On the x-axis is time in minutes. So normally, the mouth is sitting comfortably up here at around 7 pH, which is neutral. But when it's exposed to acid in the form of drinks, food, gastric acid, or 
what we've been talking about mostly, lactic acid produced by karyogenic bacteria, the pH of plaque covering teeth decreases rapidly, hitting a minimum value within about 10 minutes. You'll notice I have a line going across here at pH 5.5. This is the critical pH of tooth enamel, the pH at which tooth mineral starts dissolving in the way that we talked about before. Anything below the critical pH is when calcium and phosphate ions are actively being leached out of the tooth. So the area colored in red is demineralization. And the area colored in green is actually what's called remineralization. And we'll talk about that right now. So let's revisit our equilibrium diagram. So we've talked about what can go wrong. Now let's talk about what can go right. Saliva is our main natural protector from cavities. And saliva contains bicarbonate, HCO3 negative which is a weak base and serves as a buffer for this equilibrium. Essentially, it acts as a distractor and complexes with the extra hydrogen ions to form carbonic acid. Now, this means that the rest, of the, the rest of the equilibrium here is untouched. It's now disconnected from what's happening over here because of this handy buffer. The presence of bicarbonate has neutralized the pH so that the mouth is no longer so acidic and we no longer have to pull on the tooth to fix the imbalance that the extra floating hydrogen ions was causing. So this allows the tooth the opportunity to regain its strength by reincorporating calcium and phosphate ions into its enamel. In fact, saliva contains calcium, which can drive this reaction to the left. Again, by Le Chatelier's principle, if we have some extra calcium floating around, contributing to what's known as remineralization, restoring mineral to the tooth and hardening the tooth as a result. So demineralization is destroying or dissolving mineral from tooth, Remineralization is restoring mineral to the tooth as long as it hasn't become physically cavitated, and we'll go over that a little bit later. There are also products like MI Paste, whose sole purpose is to buffer acids and increase concentration of these free minerals in saliva, thereby increasing its concentration in the teeth themselves, shifting the equilibrium to the left, and remineralizing the tooth. Saliva also contains fluoride when a patient is drinking fluoridated water, using fluoridated mouth rinse and toothpaste, and so on. So why is fluoride so important to tooth health? Well, as we can see, it remineralizes the tooth by driving this reaction to the left, just like calcium did. And not only that, it replaces the hydroxyl group to make another form of appetite that we already mentioned before, floor appetite. Floor appetite has a more stable crystal lattice, which doesn't let go of its calcium as easily as the carbonate substituted hydroxy appetite. So not only does it make the tooth harder, but it also makes the tooth more resistant to future acid damage. So let me show you how that works. So let's revisit the Stefan curve. We talked about how it reaches a minimum in about 10 minutes after what I'll call an acid challenge. This could be eating breakfast, eating a snack, drinking coffee, etc. And it takes about 30 minutes for the bicarbonate in the saliva to buffer the pH back to normal. Now chewing sugar-free xylitol gum would actually stimulate saliva production in the mouth and cause this curve to return above critical pH faster than it would have without it, because now we're having more saliva bathing that tooth. On the other hand, 
a patient with dry mouth or xerostomia would take well over an hour to buffer this pH back to normal because well, they have less saliva and they have less natural protection. So how pH recovers as a function of how often you eat and drink, how long you eat and drink for, what you eat, the stickiness of the food, the quality of the saliva, how you brush your teeth, all of those factors play a role in your caries risk. So to show you the power of fluoride, let's take a look at this new and improved Stefan curve for floor appetite, or FA for short. For enamel incorporating fluoride, the critical pH is now, it's no longer at 5.5, it's way down here at 4.5, which means it will take a stronger acid challenge to get below that and start causing demineralization. So you can visualize the benefits just by looking at the area under the curve. That initial acid challenge we had before doesn't even reach below it, so this tooth isn't at risk of demineralization at all. And that's the power of fluoride. So to review, fluoride prevents tooth decay by three distinct mechanisms. And this is an excellent, excellent board exam question. I would definitely know these three by heart. So number one, it remineralizes the tooth structure by shifting the equilibrium to the left, in our example. It decreases enamel solubility, it lowers, and that's by lowering that critical pH. And I haven't mentioned this yet, but also important, it interferes with the metabolic activity of the cariogenic bacteria. Three unique mechanisms, all working in tandem to prevent tooth decay. Pretty cool stuff. Also important for the board exam, I've mentioned the first two in passing, but just to give you a nice snapshot of these really important numbers to know, enamel that's, that has fluoride, fluorapatite, that's a 4.5, it's our best critical pH. Carbonate substituted hydroxyapatite is at 5.5. And then root dentin and cementum is somewhere up here between 6.2 and 6.7. So you can see it's a lot more vulnerable and this is why exposed root surfaces are more susceptible to acid erosion and tooth decay because their threshold is much closer to the physiologic normal pH and so those surfaces are way more vulnerable to acid challenges. So caries, it's a multifactorial transmissible infectious dynamic oral disease. That is a mouthful. No pun intended. So caries is the result of, as you know by now, an interaction of cariogenic oral flora, which form a plaque or biofilm with fermentable dietary carbohydrates, the sugars we talked about, on the tooth surface, which is the host of the disease. And it has to be over a period of time. So the initial diagram to describe caries was plaque, tooth, and diet, and having all three of those together would cause caries, but it's better mo modeled by the modified Keyes-Jordan diagram, which is down here. This adds a fourth circle of, being, of time because it takes time for this stuff to develop. And they're so, and actually there's so many other factors that you can see in the top left and the top right here. There's saliva, pH, fluoride, hygiene, all things that we've touched on throughout this video. And again, most importantly, we need time for a cavity to happen. This isn't something that's happening overnight. And this is how the modified diagram came to be. So it's a balance between demineralization and remineralization, pathologic and protective factors, like a seesaw going up and down. It's a constant tug of war between the good and the bad. And caries is something we manage as dentists, not only at the tooth level, but holistically at the total patient level. When we're talking about things like diet and hygiene, that's at a holistic level. So let's get into the nitty gritty. These next couple of slides, I guarantee you, are going to be filled to the brim with some really, really good board exam stuff. So definitely take note of some of this red text 
I guarantee you it's going to pop up on that exam. So bacteria like to make a home in the deep pits and fissures of teeth where toothbrush bristles struggle to reach. And so the bacteria just sit there, they secrete their lactic acid and go untouched. So when it's a pit and fissure lesion, you get this inverted V shape, which means it starts out narrow and as it penetrates through the enamel, it gets wider until it reaches the dentin enamel junction. By contrast, a smooth surface lesion, this can be on the facial surface near the gum line, but most commonly it's on the mesial or distal surface right up against an adjacent tooth. This is the opposite situation. It starts out wide and narrows out until it reaches the dentin enamel junction, at which point dentin is a lot easier to penetrate than enamel, so it spreads out again, kind of forms this double arrowhead and then penetrates deeper and deeper until it gets treated. And lastly, we have root surface lesions over here on the right. And as we talked about, they can progress rapidly because there's no enamel. No, it's a, a V shape, just like the smooth surface lesion, as the root surface is also a smooth surface. And again, we talked about the critical pH being much higher, hence why it can progress so much quicker. We also have to make the distinguish the we have to distinguish between infected dentin and affected dentin. So infected dentin refers to this superficial, wet, soft, mushy, necrotic dentin. That's this stuff. It's easily removed and it has to be removed because bacteria are present there. This is a site of active infection. Whereas a affected dentin is deeper. It's dry, it's leathery, it's demineralized, but not invaded by bacteria. So that's a little bit deeper in this cavity preparation. You can also see how they're distinguished in this awesome diagram. We have infected dentin on top and then affected dentin down here. You also get some sclerotic dentin. That's where the dentin is a little bit harder and tries to resist the passage of caries deeper and deeper into the tooth. An affected dentin is affected by bacterial toxins and acids, but again, the actual bacteria have not made a home there yet. So it's usually okay to leave effect affected dentin at the base of your prep, particularly if you're close to the pulp and you're worried about exposing it. So let's talk a little bit more about progress of lesions. We can have an intact surface which is essential for that remineralization process. So we need that enamel to be intact for there to be remineralization, the equilibrium driving to the left. Cavitation, a nick or a hole, is an irreversible process that now requires restorative treatment. We cannot remineralize a cavitation back to a smooth, intact surface. Cavitation is irreversible. And like I said, this takes time. It may take one to two years to form an actual enamel cavitation or cavity. So from a white spot to a cavitation can take one to two years. That's a long, long time. So that's this tug of war between remineralization and demineralization, demineralization occurring over years and the demineralization finally winning. So the order and I have seen this as a board exam question by itself, is enamel demineralization first, the surface remains intact, then we get dentin demineralization, so start to see just little evidences of these tiny little de demineral demineralized regions of dentin, and then we get that enamel cavitation. So this is our irreversible stage where that we can actually feel a cavity there and then we get dentin cavitation where that cavity progresses much much more quickly at that point so enamel demon dentin demon enamel cavitation dentin cavitation that is the order of a cavity so some really good terms to know we're going to talk about caries terms 
with regards to extent of the lesion first. So an incipient lesion or a reversible lesion occurs on a smooth or when it occurs on a smooth surface, you're going to notice this very specific quality. It appears opaque white when it's air dried, but it seems to go away when it's wet. So that we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more in the next video when we talk about the clinical exam, how we look for caries and detect them. But that is an important thing to know for the incipient caries lesion. So if we're talking about incipient, we're kind of in this enamel demon, maybe dentin demon. There's some uh, controversy there, but we're certainly not at the cavitation point. So incipient, we're in this safe zone where we can reverse the process back to normal. And then on the flip side, we have the cavitated or irreversible lesion where the enamel surface is broken, it's no longer intact, and usually the lesion has advanced into dentin. Again, we see now we're on this half. So we're starting off in incipient lesion territory, we can reverse it, then at this point, we're no longer reversible. So that's incipient and cavitated. Now let's talk about caries terms with regards to the location. Really good stuff here. A simple cavity, simple caries lesion, covers one surface of a tooth. So occlusal is the most common simple lesion you'll find on a posterior tooth. Um, it, if you're curious, this is also true for a restoration. So restorations are also um, given, they can also be classified by these first three terms here. So simple, one surface. Compound is two surfaces. So mesio-occlusal, disto-occlusal. Complex means it covers three or more surfaces of the tooth. So MOD, or it could be MODFL, it could be all five surfaces of a tooth. So this is Carey's terms with regards to how many surfaces that cavity is affecting. And the restoration to fix that can also be defined by those same terms. Down here we have the primary caries lesion. A primary lesion is the original caries lesion. So in other words, it's the first time lesion on that surface. You have a virgin tooth that's never been affected by a cavity before. You notice a cavity on the occlusal surface of it. That's a primary lesion. Now, if you had a tooth that already had a restoration, let's say on the mesial surface, but it never had anything on the distal surface and the dentist noticed, notices that the distal surface now has decay, that distal surface is also a primary lesion because it's the first time that surface got decay. In contrast, we have the secondary or recurrent caries lesion. And this occurs at the junction of a tooth and a restoration indicating microleakage underneath that restoration. There is marginal gap, bacteria got in there, secreted that lactic acid, and created another cavity. So it's, a, it's caries that's born from another lesion that had already been restored, but now we have decay underneath it. This is important to distinguish from residual, which kind of, it seems like the same thing at first, but it's, it's distinctly different. So residual caries, residual lesion, refers to caries that remain in a completed tooth prep. So that means that we did the preparation and immediately after that preparation's done, there's still caries there. That lesion was not completely removed. Sometimes that's done on purpose, but most of the time it's not. And it's a, an unfortunate uh, thing when that happens, that ca caries was left behind and that is residual caries. Recurrent caries occurs when that restoration was done, caries was completely removed, and then at a later date, caries now affected that area. So some really good location terms. Let's finish this off with caries terms that has to have to do with the rate of the decay progression. So we have up here acute or rampant caries, this is where you get rapid damage to the tooth structure. It's lightly colored, it feels soft, and it's infectious. In contrast, chronic or slow caries, 
means we have demineralized two structure that's almost remineralized. It's discolored. It's fairly hard. It's progressing at a slower rate. That tug of war is not so one-sided like it was with acute. It's a little bit more balanced. We're getting a little bit more remineralization to help fight off that progression. And then we can have arrested lesions that occur that appear brown or black. They're hard to the touch and they're caries resistant if exposed to fluoride. So this is a cavity that has completely has been arrested completely. The equilibrium is not moving in the direction of demineralization, which is a good thing. And if it's in the dentin, we get that sclerotic dentin, that's that hard dentin that is is laid down by the odonoblasts to protect the tooth from further ingress of bacteria. So if we look down here, which of these looks worse to you? And maybe at first glance you'd say, well, the one on the right looks darker and just more, more for, formidable in some ways. But knowing what you know now, that's actually an arrested lesion. And so that's a good thing. And if you examine that with an explorer, it would be hard to the touch, whereas the left one would be soft. And that is an active rampant caries lesion. That's an active caries lesion. It's actively progressing. And that one certainly needs to be restored. The arrested one, maybe if they're not, if you're not concerned with the, you know, the overall health of the tooth, it's, there's no pulp exposure. It's, it's sound, there's no risk of you know, fracture. It could be left alone unless the aesthetics uh, bothers the patient. But of course, be best to restore that as well because that's just a retentive area for food and plaque to, to get in there. So in the periodontic series, we talked about the different microbiological hypotheses for gum disease. And for caries, it's pretty simple. We abide primarily by the specific plaque hypothesis where only specific bacteria in the oral cavity cause caries. And those are cariogenic bacteria. So let's talk about three specific bacteria that are most intimately related with dental caries. The big one, Streptococcus mutans. This one is the, the big bad for enamel caries. It's a gram-positive cocci, and it produces glucosal glucosal transferase, or GTF, which converts sucrose, which is our kind of main sugar from most of our foods that we're eating, it converts that to glucans and fructans, which are extracellular polysaccharides that help the bacteria stick to the tooth. So it, these glucans and fructans are kind of like uh, slime, the sticky stuff that helps the bacteria adhere to the tooth. So really bad for us, good for the bacteria. It's also acidogenic and acidiric. We know it's acidogenic, which means it converts the sucrose into lactic acid via fermentation, which we talked about in our big equilibrium diagram. And it also, it's aciduric, it's durable and acid. It tolerates the acid well. So it can bathe in its own secretion, so to speak, and it doesn't it doesn't get uh, damaged or killed from having low pH. It actually likes it. And it also produces bacteriocins, which means it can kill off competing microbes. So this thing is nasty, and it is definitely the main cause of enamel caries, and certainly a really, really important one to know for the board exam and for life moving forward. We also have lactobacillus, which is the primary cause of uh, dentinal caries, and actinomyces, which is the primary cause for root caries. So this is a bit of an oversimplification, but I definitely think it's, it's helpful to know for the board exam. It just kind of keeps it easy, and you just have to think of one bacteria for one region or one zone of the tooth that's affected by caries. And so I've talked a lot about what can go wrong and the caries process. We also touched on remineralization. And so, as you know, the main natural protective element is saliva. So saliva can come to the rescue. Of course, brushing your teeth is the best thing you can do, but saliva contains a lot of great stuff to help us out. 
So it has glycoproteins up here, these large molecules that can agglutinate bacteria together, just glue them and stick them all together to help eliminate them through swallowing. So they get stuck all together and get swallowed with a bolus of food. Urea and other buffers uh, like bicarbonate that we talked about dilutes the bacterial acid byproducts, helps drive the reaction to the right. It contains lysozyme, which destroys cell walls. So that's really useful. It can kill bacteria, damage them. Lactoferrin actively binds iron, which is important for bacterial enzymes. So it steals away the iron that the bacteria like to use. Iron that ferrous that's coming in here. And lacto, I like to kind of remember act from lacto in activate, and then uh, iron, of course, related to this stem of the word. So lactoferrin inactivates iron. And then we have lactoperoxidase, which inactivates bacterial enzymes. So again, we have act here, so we're inactivating aces, which are enzymes. So that's how I keep these two things straight, and they almost always pop up on the board exam. So just a little helpful memory tip there. Saliva also contains salivary IgA, which is aminoglobulin A. It's a salivary antibody that's uh, specifically made against bacteria in the oral cavity. Of course, saliva is also containing calcium, phosphate, and fluoride ions that help with remineralization. You know all about that by now. And it also contains these other things that can help promote the remineralization process. All right, so that's it for this video, guys. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed it. I think this is a fascinating topic and some really good stuff for the board exam, but also just some really fun stuff to learn about. So hopefully you enjoyed it as much as I did. Please like this video. If you did, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to this channel for much more on dentistry. If you're interested in supporting this channel and what I do, please check out my Patreon page. Thank you to Michael Raja, Reb Boyd, David Jaden, Isabella Caldas, Ali Benjir, Badir Hafnawi, and all of my patrons for their support. You can unlock extras like access to my video slides to take notes on and practice questions for the board exam. So go check that out. The link is in the description. Thanks again for watching, everyone. I'll see you in the next video.